Good morning, church. How y'all doing? Tired. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Woo. Well, hey, actually, real quick, before I go forward, I want to introduce you guys to Amanda. Um, Amanda is our ASL interpreter today. She's helping me out. Um, so uh, if uh, you see Amanda after the service, uh, feel free to, to say hi and welcome her to the community today. Um, but yeah, so it's a little different for us, I know, but this is a good thing uh, because it's our job to remove barriers to the gospel. Amen? Yes. Amen. Awesome. Well, hey, folks, today, but we uh, believe that as part of our role as the Jesus community, we have to participate in the mission of God. And so we have a couple ways to serve here. We talk about these every week, but communion, we do communion uh, once a month, the first Sunday of the month, and we need help from you guys to do it. We need bakers, we need people to prep the table, we need people to pass plates. Also, we are constantly taking donations for the local homeless shelters. Uh, the biggest needs right now are gonna be in personal hygiene products, specifically female hygiene items. Um, and so if... Uh, you're out shopping, pick it up, up an extra box, drop it in the uh, donation box um, when you come next Sunday. And when that box fills up, I will drive it to uh, the shelters and get those donations in the hands of people who need them. Um, today, we're going to continue our series on prayer uh, by looking at what it looks like to participate in what God is already doing. Bless the Lord. Again, thank you, CJ. <laughs> oh, man, I don't know about you guys. Worship was awesome this morning. I love, I love singing those songs. Holy cow. So, hey, uh, prayer uh, can be kind of a funny thing um, for, for some of us. Um, you may have heard me uh, uh, complain about some... Uh, what I call Christianese in the past. Um, often when we're going into a situation of, let's say, stress, someone might pray for you and pray protection over you, and one of the things they might say, yeah, Angela already knows what I'm going to say here, one of the things they might say is they might pray for a hedge of protection around you, which I find funny because when I think of protection I don't typically think of hedges. Um, I don't, I don't, when I think about it, I don't particularly feel protected by greenery and bushes. I mean, why not pray for a concrete wall of protection with a razor wire top? But see, we get so used to the rhythm and wording of our prayers, we feel like we need to like 
say the things or fill the space with the statements that we say on a regular basis. You know, like, like the hedge of protection or the traveling mercies or whatever. Or, or I don't know, um, I'm guilty of this. Do you know what I mean when I say the just, just prayers? Uh-huh. That's when, like, God, if you would just do, if you could just do this, if just, just God, if just God, you could just, 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 just. She's having a ball right now. <laughs> Here's the thing. God doesn't just do anything. All right? He can do everything. Or um, the other one that I'm guilty of a lot is the father, father prayers. Do you know what I mean by that? When we just keep saying the name of God over and over again, it's like, Father, if you could just, Father, if you could just uh, lift me up, Father, if you could just help me, Father. Have you ever thought about that? Like, how, what if you talk to your friends that way? Like, Hey, Corey, can you, Corey, if you can just, Corey, if you can just meet me for a coffee, Corey, the other day, Corey, like, that would be awesome if we could just, Corey, go for coffee, Corey. Corey? <laughs> Corey's going to be like, dude, you're weird. <laughs> he probably already says that about me, but. We just need to fill the space. Or we're so committed to the routine of prayer um, that, or the routine of uh, praying before we eat, for example, that that sometimes those prayers, we just kind of get into the routine where the, the prayers themselves don't make sense. Like, have you ever sat down to pray for your meal, but your meal is like Twinkies and a bag of potato chips? <laughs> You're like, God, please bless this bag of tortilla chips and seven-layer bean dip. I imagine there'll be some of those prayers later tonight. Or, God, please take away the carbs in this pizza miraculously. Or, do you know why we pray at meals? Do you know why we pray at meals? <laughs> because, yeah, it, on one hand, it's to take time to honor God and give thanks for what we have. But also, and it's just something we do every day. So it's a great uh, reminder that we need to pray and thank God. We all eat, and so we kind of have established it into our culture that we pray before we eat so that we know here's a time, at the very least, we will pray every time we eat. So it's a good reminder. At its core, prayer is simply talking to God. It's having a conversation but we can often miss that, and we stress ourselves out trying to say the right words in the right way. And as a result, we end up taking what's intended for intimate conversation and turning it into a, an impersonal exchange or an incantation, like if we say the magic words, genie God will give us what we want. So this series, um, Prayer, Grasping at the Heart of God, what we've been doing is we're trying to spend this first quarter, the first section of 2024, taking this deep dive into the concept of prayer. And in doing so, how do we take steps to deepen our individual relationships with our Father in Heaven? Not just saying the right things or going to the right places or praying at the right times, but getting ourselves in the headspace, in the position to have a truly intimate and meaningful relationship with God. Some of the highlights through the series so far, we started out talking about holy ground and about how as Jesus followers, we believe that the Holy Spirit dwells within us. And because of that, everywhere you go is holy ground. You don't need to say the right thing or do the right thing because God is in you. Everywhere you step is the temple of God. We also talked about the importance of adoration and taking a second to just meditate, to sit on the fact that God is so vast, so big, so good, more so than we can ever possibly imagine. We talked about confession and the importance of taking your burdens, taking your scars, and laying them at the feet of the cross, because at the end of the day, we're all messed up, and if anyone claims that they're not, they're lying, okay? We're all broken, and we all need Jesus. This week, I want to take a look at how Jesus prayed. And not just how he prayed, but how does the, how does the, the way Jesus prayed tell us about how, 
how we should pray? What can we learn from the way that Jesus prayed? So I'm going to get a little nerdy on you. I know, surprise, surprise. But um, here's the thing. Nearly all world religions um, and all worldviews have some aspect that they call prayer. Okay? Um, even within the church, you know, we have a thousand different ways to pray, different world religions, different beliefs. Even some philosophies have something that we would say is parallel, at least, to what we call prayer. I mean, some of that prayer is very active. You know, begging the heavens for some sort of intercession, action, or, or, or convincing God to come and interrupt the normal course of things. These prayers can be fervent, they can be energetic, they can be emotional, they're direct. Then we also know of passive praying, quiet contemplation, meditation, silence, emptying oneself of the need to ask at all, learning peace. Uh, the book that we're covering in our book club right now, uh, we're, we're doing that at the, at, after the service for those that are interested, is called Praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools. And in chapter 7, Tyler Staten, the author, kind of breaks down this active, passive voice in a really interesting way. So I'm going to quote him here. All right. Most people know the active kind of prayer. Trying to will God to adopt our own will. Usually with good motives, we try to usher in the action of God. We give our most, best, compelling case, betraying the assumption that we need to talk God into something. And most of us know the passive sort of prayer, trying to let God be and simply let ourselves be. We aren't asking for anything. In fact, we may be trying to empty ourselves of the desire to ask for anything at all. Attempting to reach a state of peace with what is. However, Jesus didn't pray all the time in an active voice, nor did he pray all the time in a passive voice. So how exactly did Jesus pray? Well, see, when Jesus prayed, he often prayed with, with what we would call a middle voice, right? Pastor and author Eugene Peterson, good guy, by the way, I've had, a, I've had a chance to meet with him, he's an awesome dude, but he describes Jesus as having prayed with what he calls a middle voice. He doesn't demand action, nor does he expect to be acted upon passively. Instead, the prayers of Jesus seem to focus on joining what God is already doing. Participation. For example, John 11, in verse 20, uh, we see Jesus praying uh, for his disciples and then also praying for his believers. And so we're going to catch up with that prayer in verse 20. This is Jesus praying himself. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their, their being the apostles, message that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Hey, that rhymes. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So Jesus is here praying for his followers. But this is also a prayer of participation. Notice phrases like, I have given them glory. I have given them the glory that you gave me. I am a, a, simply a, a space to pass through. I'm a vessel for your love in the moment. Ultimately, it's a prayer for unity for the Jesus community that we would join in God's unity, in God's love, in God's plan for creation, and that through that participation, the world would see the reality of God and his glory. This prayer, you can go back to that, that, that slide, this prayer 
is calling for the people of God to come alongside God. Jesus isn't just simply saying, God, do this. Nor is he saying, God, thank you for doing this. He is saying, God, you are doing something. I am a part of what we are doing. It gets confusing, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But also, bring along these people and so that they can participate in what God, what you are doing. Okay, you can continue here. Praying in the middle voice is acknowledging that God is already doing something. He's already working while also acknowledging our need to act in some way. Our need to participate. Our need to align ourselves with God. Not simply that we would be given the gift, or given the thing we desire, not simply that we sit and dwell in emptiness, but rather that we participate, come alongside the work that God is doing, the mission that is already unfolding. So praying in the middle voice is less about asking God to do something and more about showing you that God is already doing something and that you are invited to join in. Now, real quick, that does not mean that, we're, that, that it's wrong to ask for specifics. Far from it. Ask. Be direct. Be active. Bring your, part, bring your petitions to God. There are examples of both active and passive prayer all over Scripture. And as Jesus' followers, we are encouraged to do both. For example, be still and know that I am God. It's a very passive prayer. And also asking for our daily bread, as we talked about last week, is a very active prayer. However, don't ignore the prayers of Jesus, which were often in this middle voice, where Jesus shows us this third way to pray that gets to our heart and of our calling, our identity, as both the Jesus community and as also image bearers of God. At its core... Praying like this is a prayer of participation. Participating with what God is doing. Participating in God's plan for creation. So two weeks ago, we talked a little bit about um, what it means to, you know, what it means with the phrase on earth as it is in heaven. And we talked about this idea that we were created with authority. We were created with a mission in mind. We were created for the purpose of tending the garden, to watch over the animals, and to generally be the hands and feet of God. We were tasked in that moment to cultivate creation, making something new out of the resources that we've been given, through the gifts that we've been given through the example of love and grace. When Adam and Eve fell from grace and the world broke, that mission didn't stop. It just now has a new dimension. Instead of simply cultivating the garden, we're helping to fix it. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works with God, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. There's a couple key points to this verse. We're going to leave that up here for a little bit. Handiwork. You are God's handiwork. You are God's masterpiece. You are a cherished treasure. You are important and you are valuable. You are loved by the creator of the universe. Some of you may be getting tired of me saying this every week, but you know what? I'm going to keep saying it every week because it's that important. No matter what messes you find yourself in from time to time, no matter if you're in a good season or a bad season, regardless of your scars, regardless of your failures, regardless of the thoughts that you pretend not to have, God still considers you his cherished masterpiece. God still considers you his loved child. 
In other words, you matter. You matter. Nobody is unimportant. Think, think of this for, for a second. Think of all of your close friends and family. All right, your kids, your siblings, your mom, your dad, even your grandparents, aunts, uncles. Think of your, your, your family and friends. All right? Think of them like in a crowd of people. Now add all of your coworkers to that crowd. All of your neighbors. All of the clients you work with at work. All of your customers. People that you see on a regular basis. Maybe it's your students. All of your kids' friends. All of their parents. Add anybody who would recognize your name if it was spoken or recognize your face if it was shown to them. Chances are, no matter who you are or what your background is, that crowd of people is starting to look pretty big. Each one of those people is someone that is part of your orbit, someone who has joy and struggles, dreams and nightmares. Each one yearns for community and acceptance, fights against their ego, wants love, wants forgiveness, rages against their own undesirable habits. Each one wants a place to belong. And your life connects to them all. You are uniquely situated to affect a staggering number of individuals. And that's just people that are here now. That's not even mentioning legacy. You are staggeringly important. You matter in ways that are beyond comprehension. God knows that. For we are God's handiwork. So that's part one of the verse. Never forget that. Part two created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Not only are you loved by God, not only are you important to God, but you are important to his plan to make others feel loved as well. You have a part to play, or better yet, frankly, you have parts to play, because the reality is, ain't none of you not important enough to have many roles. <laughs> I've often found that nobody, nobody's importance is small enough to only have one role. God is doing something in creation around us. And you are called to be a part of it. God is the one doing the work. He has set the stage. He has the, equipped the players, you, and has called action. Get to work. Go do it. Go out into the world. Be the people I have called you to be. You have a mission from creation. You have a mission from Jesus. Go and make disciples of all the world. We have work to do, and if you're on this side of the dirt, you still have work to do. What would it look like if when we pray, we ask God to reveal what he's already doing? To reveal not just how he's at work, but also how we can participate with what he is already doing. He's placed you where you need to be to have a staggering effect on that plan. So what does participation in God's work actually look like? What does this all mean kind of when we get down to earth? Um, there's a pastor I know out in Omaha. He passed, he's one of the pastors of the Abide Network of Churches in North O. Uh, his name is Josh Dotzler. Great dude. Um, and uh, he actually gave this talk, um, which starts with this weird kind of Venn diagram. Go ahead and put that image up. It's this three-way Venn diagram. Uh, when asked about how to determine what God is calling you towards. What's that? Oh, you can't see anything up here. Awesome. <laughs> I had no idea. It's back there. <laughs> we 
Got it. Awesome. Well, here we go. I'll just describe it to you. I'm not sure what's going on with our technical difficulties. But here's the deal. It's a Venn diagram. There are three questions to ask yourself. One, what breaks your heart? Two, what gifts and advantages have you been given? And three, how have your experiences led you to this point? All right? Look at the intersection of those three questions. What breaks your heart? What about the people around you? What moves you to tears? What are you just not okay with existing for the future? What really moves you to action? What's the greatest injustice that you see on a regular basis? Two, what gifts or advantages do you, have you been given? What resources do you have? What talents do you have? What gifts do you have? What comforts that you have that set you apart? And then two, uh, sorry, three, what experiences have you had that lead you to this point? And I've heard versions of this explanation several times in my life, but when Josh presented this to me, uh, it struck me, because I, I did this process, and I would say, okay, what breaks my heart? What breaks my heart is people who feel alone. What breaks my heart is people that feel disconnected, that feel like they are beyond love or beyond care, who are yearning for community but don't have it. What breaks my heart is people that feel like they're on their own and have no hope. That really breaks my heart. What gifts have I been given? Um, I'm loud. <laughs> I talk a lot. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I can talk to anybody. And I also tend to be fearless in some conversations. I, I can walk into unique situations and be okay. Actually, in one of my last churches, they uh, nicknamed me the pastor of weird um, because if something was going to happen that required a pastor to have an interesting conversation with police or an episode or um, somebody uh, having a psychotic break, they sent Josh. And then three, how have my experiences led me to this point? Um, as I've been open with you guys about, I've routinely had my own battles with anxiety and depression and figuring out what my own worth is and where I fit and the battles I've had to face and continue to face in answering those questions. So for me, when I intersect these lines and try to see where God is calling my life, where God's mission has been placed on me, I look at this and I see, oh, God has called me to make sure everyone around me knows they are loved. That's my mission in life. That's what breaks my heart, that's where my gifts align, and that's where my experiences are. That whatever I do, my mission statement in life is to make sure that people around me, that people who have been put in my orbit, that people that I intersect with know that they are loved and they are valuable. What's yours? Ask those questions. What breaks your heart? What gifts do you have? And how have your experiences led you to this point? You'd be amazed at what you see. This is also described in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. See, the mission of God hasn't really changed since Adam and Eve were placed in the garden. We're called to act as God's hands and feet in creation, to speak as God speaks, to act as God acts, to reflect the grace and love and encouragement of God in all things, to love, to serve, to encourage, 
to take what God has given us and to build something new, cultivating new fruits, multiply, create more and more enclaves of heaven in creation. That's what the church is, by the way. We're an enclave of heaven. We're like the foreign consulate in this world of heaven. Okay? In the same way, if you go to another con- country and visit the uh, United States consulate and you enter and like it's United States soil, technically, and United States rules on that little block in that building, and you can talk to United States officials and all that kind of that's how it works here. Oh, hold on. Boom. There you go. Pardon us. The church is like a foreign consulate, like an enclave of heaven on earth. That's what we're called to be. See, in in 1 Corinthians, Paul is addressing some disunity that arose from people uh, following uh, different gospel teachers. And... In the verse that I'm about to read, he mentions one of those teachers, Apollos. And you don't need to know the specifics about Apollos, only that he was another gospel teacher, okay, at the time. And here we are, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field and God's building. God is the one doing the work. He's the one that makes the plants grow. We join in what God is already doing. We are co-laborers in that mission. We water the plant. We care for the plant. We love. We nurture. We encourage. We teach. We welcome. We embrace. We serve. We build the enclave by cultivating the seeds that God has planted. When the prophet Isaiah was first commissioned into his role as a prophet, we see this interesting exchange that, I, that most of us have heard a thousand times, but it's so good to bury in your soul and has shaped the reality of ministry ever since. In Isaiah 6, 8, we see this exchange where God is calling out And he says, therefore I heard a voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who will go with us? And what does Isaiah say? Here am I. Send me. Here am I. Send me. There is a mission going on. There is a plan at work. God is spreading the seed of heaven all throughout the world, and we, the people of God, the Jesus community, are called to cultivate it. We're called to come alongside the mission of God, to love, to encourage, to embrace, to welcome You know, 99%, I'm going to tell you a secret, 99%, 99% of effective ministry is presence. It's being there. It's being available. It's all it is. God doesn't need you to single-handedly fix the world. He doesn't need you to charge the gate by yourself and fix everything through the sweat of your brow and uh, to change the world through your own simple actions and carry the weight of all the brokenness on your shoulders. He wants you to show up. He wants you to walk through the doors that he opens for you. You know, a very wonderfully wise friend of mine who may or may not be the chairman of the elders of this church um, recently said in a conversation, when God opens a door, you should go through it. (laughs) That's good advice. 
That's what participation looks like. It's asking God to show us the doors. And when he does, you go through it. You go through it without fear, you go through it boldly, and you go through it knowing that God's going to take care of you. If we are going to pray like Jesus, it means asking God to show us the doors that he's opening, to show us what he's doing, how we can join with the plan and help cultivate our little corner of creation and help grow this enclave of heaven. In other words, asking God where we need to show up. So, in, uh, as you walk in, you pass that welcome table, and there's that crystal bowl. And I have to say that very carefully, because it is not a crystal ball. Um, here at church, we don't have crystal balls. We have a crystal bowl. Justin is standing by it right now. Um, and in that, you'll see these little vials similar to the ones we passed out several weeks ago, but this time they're full. Each of the vials are full, filled with a, uh, a kind of a random assortment of um, native wildflower seeds to Iowa. They're all full of Iowa wildflowers. Because here, here's the deal. Every Jesus follower has the Holy Spirit dwelling within them, Correct? This means that every Jesus follower is holy ground, correct? And every Jesus follower then also has all the information, all the gifts, all the resources inside themselves to grow their own little enclave of the kingdom of heaven here wherever they stand, correct? We are like seeds ourselves, carrying with us all the information that's needed just needs the ground, just needs the circumstances, just needs someone to cultivate so that we can grow and plant the kingdom that we are called to plant. To that end, I invite at the end of the service today on your way out, grab one of these vials. Okay? Just a little vial. Each one has, I mean, I... I they're pulled from a collection of about 43 different wildflowers, all native to Iowa. You can plant them in your yard if you want. You can plant them in a pot if you want. Or you can not plant them at all and just kind of keep them as seeds as a reminder um, that that's, we are called to cultivate. But either way, I want to invite you to grab one of these as just kind of a reminder to who we are. We're growing the garden. We're cultivating the garden. We're cultivating the fruit in creation. Our mission is to grow little enclaves of heaven in every corner of creation, to go to the dark corners of all of creation, to redeem what is broken, and to grow flowers where there were weeds. Jesus prayed often in this middle voice, which was this way of participating, coming alongside what God is already doing, walking through the doors that God is opening. We should be praying the same prayers. God is doing an immense amount of things. God is doing so much. I mean, even I look around in here and knowing many of you for only less than a year that I've known you guys, I see stories unfolding in your lives right now in this moment. Think of how God has led you over the years. Think of the story, the work that God has been doing in your own heart. Think of the work that God is doing in your neighbors, in your community. God is doing something amazing. He's calling you to participate in it. He's calling you to let loose and ride the current of the river. To go out into the middle of the river and ride through. Even if the, whatever rapids come doesn't matter, just stick to the river. God's got a plan going and he, need, he, he, he wants, he desires, he invites you to be a part of what he is doing. 
God's mission, and therefore our mission, is to redeem creation. We are called to be co-laborers in that mission. We're not called to be the lone hero. We're not called to be the guy standing on a hill, leading the troops to victory, single-handedly strong-arming the devil into submission. That's not your job. You're not the hero of our story. We already have a hero, and his name is Jesus. Instead, what we need are servants. We need co-laborers. We need brothers and sisters. We need welcoming communities. We need support structures, friends, safe places, little enclaves of God's glory and God's love and God's grace in this dark world. We need places and people and houses and families that love like Jesus. We need kingdom builders. That's what we're called to be. We need people to show up. We need followers to seek out what God is already doing and answer just like Isaiah. Here am I, send me. Let's pray. Dear Father God, right now I pray for our little corner of creation, for Union Park, for Des Moines, for Iowa. You are doing something here. You are opening doors. And I pray that each and every one of us have the boldness to step through the doors that you open. Light a fire under us. Give us the urgency to chase your mission to be little enclaves of your kingdom here on earth, on earth as it is in heaven, growing your kingdom here, your kingdom now. God, we know that we have everything we need. We have your very presence in our heart. Wherever we go, we go with your power stepping on holy ground every step of the way. I don't know what tasks lay ahead of us in the, the months and weeks and days ahead. I have no idea. But I know you do. And so God, I pray, show us the doors that are open. Give us the fervent hearts to walk through them, the boldness to walk through them, come what may. Give us the excitement at seeing you work in the lives that we see every day. Give us what we need to be your people here, now. God, you are so good, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of time, with no point of reference, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of
God of your promise, you don't speak in vain, no syllable empty or void. For once you have spoken, all nature and science follow the sound of your voice. It is by grace 
we have been saved. Through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one could boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Saved by grace, equipped by God, sent by God. Here am I, Lord. Send me. Let's go. Spread the seed of the gospel of Jesus Christ to those around us. Amen. See you all next week.